Hello, everybody. Welcome again to the Anita Posho, a Bitcoin only podcast. The following is a panel discussion that was held at the Adopting Bitcoin conference in San Salvador in November. The topic of the talk is Lightning and the Creator Economy, how the Lightning Network will power new revenue models for artists and creators. I had the honor to moderate this panel and my guests were Desiree Dickerson, she's the CEO and co-founder of Thunder Games, Colin Harper, a journalist and content creator at Luxor Technologies, Roy Scheinfeld, co-founder and CEO of Breeze Technology, and Michael Tidwell, the head of systems operations at CBD. As always, you can watch this interview on YouTube or you can listen to it in your favorite podcast player. Try something new. Try a lightning-enabled podcast app like the Breeze app. Roy Scheinfeld, a guest on the panel, is the CEO and co-founder of Breeze. Or you can also use the Sphinx Chat app. It's the end of 2021. Tomorrow is the last day of the year. I wish you a wonderful start into the new year. And I hope I will hear and uh, see you again next year. So you will listen to me and I will listen to you. And I recorded some predictions for Bitcoin in 2022. You can find them on my YouTube channel. And now a short word from my sponsors and then on to the show. Enjoy. Living on crypto is easier than you think with Bitrefill. Choose from over 4,000 gift cards and mobile top-up options from around the world. I used Bitrefill to top up my phone when I was visiting Zimbabwe. It was easy, worked like a charm, and I even earned sats back. Pay with Bitcoin, Lightning, Ethereum, Dash, Tether over Tron, and many more options. No account is necessary. Join the thousands of users around the world who are living on crypto today using Bitrefill. Join now at bitrefill.com and start earning sats back with each purchase. That's bit refill.com Did you know that leaving your keys on centralized exchanges is extremely risky? Not only are you giving up your privacy, but you also give up total control of your funds. The best time to take back control is now. Go to sovereign.app and never again ask for permission to use your money. That's S O V R Y N dot app. Welcome everyone. Yeah, uh, the topic is lightning and the creator economy. And uh, for a start, please, I would ask you to introduce yourself. Like, how is your project or product related to this topic? Sure. So, hey, I'm Michael Tidwell. I work at a company called Zebedee. We do help uh, content creators in a way. We are a video game focused company, but we do have the ability for people to accept lightning tips if they are content creators uh, through Twitch and Twitter, things like this. So I think that's a good summary. Hi, I'm Roy Scheinfeld from Breeze. A lot of you know Breeze from, like, you think about Breeze as a wallet. Uh, we like to think about Breeze as the interface to the lightning economy. And part of, of, of that, we integrated podcasting 2.0 into our platform allowing users to send chats to content creators, specifically podcasters. Uh, I'm Colin Harper. I'm uh, the uh, director of research and content at Luxor Technologies. It's a uh, Bitcoin mining pool in North America. So not related to Lightning at all, but I used to be a journalist at Coindesk and Bitcoin Magazine and uh, just always been really passionate about how Lightning Network could unlock, you know, uh, new tools for people to use to, you know, maybe send micropayments to pay for single articles or, you know, stream payments to journalists that they like, things like that. Awesome. Um, I am Desiree Dickerson. I am CEO at Thunder Games, and we focus solely on mobile games and really um, onboarding a mass of people through mobile, to Bitcoin through mobile games. Thank you. So uh, for the most part of Bitcoin's history, uh, it has been a store of value only. So we couldn't do much more uh, with it. And this is still a very important use case. But with the advent of the Lightning Network, we are now able to send micropayments uh, over the internet and directly to content creators. One of these first uh, examples uh, that has got a lot of traction is podcasting 2.0. Roy, would you please explain uh, how it works and what sure. it is? 
Sure, sure. So yeah, that, that's the key thing, I think. Lightning changes the way we interact with money. One of the things that Lightning can do and Fiat actually can't do, uh, where Lightning is superior to Fiat, is the ability to stream sats, to send small micropayments to, uh, to whomever. Specifically, in our case, we've integrated with uh, the podcasting 2.0 platform. Adam Curry isn't here, but Adam Curry is the podfather. He created podcasting and is working, the recent years, is working on this platform called podcasting 2.0 where content creator can register their podcast in the podcast index platform and then uh, uh, and then they can actually get sats directly from their listeners uh, they're using a model called value for value model meaning there's no enforcement as a listener you're not obligated to pay currently the the, the content creator the podcasters but it works a lot of people are streaming sets to, to, to podcasters. And at Breeze, we've integrated uh, podcasting as part of our app, as part of our interface to Lightning Economy. When you open Breeze, you have a podcast section. You can search for podcasters. There are, I think, 2,500 podcasts on, yes. on the platforms already. And, and many people are actually making a decent salaries, a decent living out of this uh, uh, podcasting 2.0 where listeners are streaming sats to content creators. There are basically two ways where you can give sats to podcasters. One is when you, you're, while you're listening, you're streaming sats, you set sat per minute. Uh, for example, 50 sats per minute, or even it can go as low as 10 sats per minute. Uh, so if you're listening to a 60 minutes podcast, you're streaming 600 sats, or you can boost. And I think that's also where Lightning is superior to Fiat is actually the, the ability of Lightning to inherently integrate metadata into the streaming of sats. So you can boost. And boost like it's a one time, yet there's a, a very nice section we liked about the podcast. You boost the podcaster, and, and, and then a lot of listeners like to use uh, numerology. I don't know why, but it's a kind of podcasting thing. So you're, you're boosting, and when, while you're boosting, you're adding a, a little bit of metadata, a message to the podcasters. So it actually also creates an interaction, a direct interaction between. The, the, the content creator and their listeners, which is, I think, that's the real revolution. Yes, and the great thing is also when there are many boosts at a certain time, then you know this is a section that people like the most. Yeah? So it's also great yeah. for, uh, as a feedback loop for a podcaster. Yeah? Exactly. There's, you can build an internal analytics around it, like what users like, what users didn't like. But you're doing that yourself. so. Can you see the, the, the messages that users are sending you? Not yet, <laughs> because it doesn't work yet on my uh, Raspberry Blitz. But um, I see the payments coming in, like every some seconds I see 10 sats or something like that. And some people send 99 sats per minute. And that's, that's great, because you see it's working, yeah. Yeah, we, I, I have podcasters that keep sending me this uh, streaming sats. Like they're, kind of addicted to this uh, flow of payments that are coming in. Yeah, I'm quite amazed actually to see that uh, the Breeze wallet, how extraordinarily easy it is for a user to send sats. That's the great thing. Thank you. I know um, one thing that I think is really interesting, and I know um, Zebedee is doing some cool work with Twitch streaming, which is obviously super big in the gaming space, but uh, one thing that I think is there's a lot of potential with is not only just empowering these creators by you know giving them new um, models for financializing their content, but also um, incentivizing behavior with their audiences. So you know, I mean, something I've been thinking about is you know guild leaders incentivizing like their guilds to like incentivizing retention for their guilds and, and different user behavior, but also with streamers, I think there's so much they can do to kind of engage their audience and get their audience coming back and their audience participating in new and creative ways. And I don't know, Michael, if that's something you've been thinking about, but I think there's a lot of potential there. Yeah, the first, the first time I saw like the interaction with Twitch and the community was actually with Flip with Bitcoin Magazine doing the marbles. And um, 
you know, like Zebedee allows this stuff with the lightning address where you can put the lightning emoji, your, your lightning address, and then um, you can get tipped, you know, either on Twitch or Twitter. And, you know, engaging with the, with the community, I know is like what Mandelduck and Chris Moss has been working on and doing various things where uh, one, of the, one of his like key mark or I guess his noteworthy uh, deployment of this is with uh, a game called Bitcoin Rally where uh, users of, of uh, people who are watching the stream can actually tip in the game and then either produce power-ups or do certain things that affect the game that people are actually playing. It's like a community involvement or interaction with the, with the audience. Yeah, it's yeah. like crossing that barrier, that like third wall between the audience and like the, the actual streamer, which I think is like really cool to like create that like that moment where it's not like, oh, hey, someone is streaming and I'm just watching. It's actually like almost physically engaging in a way through value, which I think is really powerful. I no, I just want to say that encouraging a good behavior, that, that's, I think, the key for what we're doing here. Because basically what we're doing, this direct interaction, this direct monetization between listeners and content creator, like Desiree said, it encourages the right behavior. Why? Because if you're tied to a, a other monetization model, like advertisements or or, or you're dependent on, on money coming from third parties, then you're less hon honest with your content. Removing, going away from the ad model creates better content. Well, and also going back to what you were saying, and Nita, you were saying about seeing which podcasts people really uh, have reacted to favorably and which ones really get people going. If you had something like that for just general content around the web, especially written form, uh, it would be a different metric to engage uh, or to uh, gauge, you know, engagement on a piece, right? So, like, instead of traffic being spoofed, sometimes that's really easy. I mean, you can look at unique users, but even that isn't necessarily always airtight. So, you could look at something like, you know, lightning tips to an article, and if you're a news site or if you're Bitcoin Magazine or something, you could really see what kind of content people really favor and what they're willing to pay for and what they want more of. Yeah, that's, that's a good point because otherwise you can spoof, you know, views and results to, to make it look like, hey, I had a million views on, like, YouTube equivalent, and really it's only had, like, 100 real users. But uh, I had a follow-up. So, so uh, this is, I used to be a podcaster back when there were no podcasts because I was bored back in, like, 2015 or so, but um, there weren't, like, any of that great podcasts back then. That's why I only, that's, that's why I filled the void for, like, a year. We but, love uh, your podcast, Mike. It's fine. Uh, my, my question is, it, it seems like the, the data is public on how many, how much tips people are making, or is that private? On so it's private because the Lightning yeah. Network is private. It's okay. up to the wallets or up to the uh, podcasters to publish this information. Adam Curry, as part of the podcast index, the podcast index is the, is the index that hosts all the new generation podcasting 2.0. They get a small cut out of the splits, the podcasting split. So they have a lot of insight on the amount that are getting in from the entire uh, podcasting 2.0 uh, platform. So, so, so I guess what my question is, is there any public data you can share with how, like, I know you said there's 2,500 podcasters that have like registered with Breeze that can be we, tipped, right? I can share that we streamed over Bitcoin to podcasters. You know, the, the 2,500 number, you can see it on the RSS feeds that have the value tag included. So that's how they count it, I guess. Sure, sure but what I guess I'm asking in is... In volume, in is volume. There, yeah, is there any public data that you can share with us? I that, just shared it. We streamed well, over a Bitcoin to podcasters. Okay, so over a Bitcoin. And then out of, would you say like the top 1% or 2% is the majority of that? Or what would you say? Or is it pretty evenly distributed? I'm there are curious. top, I would say there, were, there are top 20 podcasts. Okay. Yeah, it's the same as in the centralized world. You know, the big ones earn the most money, and uh, in the long tail, it's less. But at least you have the, mo the possibility to do it, to earn money. And the great thing also is the split, the automatic split that you can enable. Like, if you have a producer and an editor, you can say, like, okay, from each SAT or from each payment coming in, the producer or the editor gets, like, 5% or 10% automatically, and you as a uh, creator, you don't have to do any accounting or su such things. And actually now there are per-episode splits, so you can even pay your guest 
if you're hosting someone in your podcast, you can split a payment to your guests and your guests are incentivized to come on your show. What kind of other uh, content can be monetized with Lightning now? Um, I mean, we have games, we have podcasting. Is there something from the journalism side that you, you are using or you are looking into? Uh, not currently. I mean, you know, like Substack has that beta for Lightning payments, right? And uh, I haven't looked into that too much. Uh, I don't really know of any journalists in the crypto or Bitcoin scene that are using it. Um, I think those tools will come eventually, but I think one of the things that we have to fix first is uh, this perception, especially in the Western world or in the U.S., where like, people are so accustomed to free content. Like the advertising model has really broken people's time preferences for what they want to read and what they want to, if they actually want to, you know, pay for this content, right? So, you know, even if they go on Forbes and there's a paywall, they just, or New York Times, they just open up an incognito tab and then they get five more free articles, right? So I think down the road, uh, what I would like to see is, uh, you know, obviously something like a, a paywall where you can pay micropayments for a single article instead of paying for a whole subscription. Um, but uh, going back to what Roy was just talking about with something like Ellen Bits, you could actually have payment models where, you know, uh, the publisher and the journalist or the writer kind of sets up certain terms where whenever an article is paid for, you know, maybe the journalist gets 50% and then, then the publication gets 50%. Um, there, go ahead, Des. No, there, was, there is um, a cool project um, that is very new. It's called Stacker News, and it's very similar to, to Hacker News. And I know um, uh, Gigi d recently did an AMA on there, and I think he um, had said that he made like 100 bucks just from that AMA. It's very new. It's kind of like a la yalls.org and Alex Bosworth, but it is something that like, you know, some folks are working on. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I love the idea of like the, the splitting the streaming payments too. I know um, Crypto Graffiti had worked on, like he did a really cool DJ set and um, you know, folks could tip and some of it went to the producer and I think some of it went to someone else um, who's kind of in the music pipeline, um, which is really interesting. So there's a lot going on in that space. Yeah, it's really interesting to see that specifically like when Crypto Graffiti did that live set um, in front of the uh, San Francisco Fed. Um, for me, it was a big aha moment because uh, my fiance Molly used to work at uh, Warner Music Group and she would do payment processing for like royalties. So, you know, like Drake has a song that's on a Pepsi ad in the Super Bowl and then someone's got to split that up between all the parties involved. And I used to joke with her that Bitcoin is eventually going to obsolete that job. And it, like now we have the tools for it, right? Programmable money. Who would have thought? Yeah. So in that context, I think there are two industries that are completely broken. Uh, one is the video industry. The second is the music industry. So when it comes to videos, you can definitely create a better OnlyFans, like streaming videos live, monetizing video live on top of Lightning. I think it will be a game changer, to be honest, because it will be an uncensored, censorship resistant video platform that you can't censor and you can monetize. Uh, it's, it's better for everyone. And in the context of the music industry, the entire royalty, royalty model in the music industry is broken. Like artists can't make a living by, by creating music. Uh, but this lightning can be a game changer in that regard that listeners can incentivize artists directly without... You know how much Spotify takes... Uh, what's the Spotify cut? It's, it's crazy. It's between... First, there's no transparency. No one knows. <laughs> so, and, 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 then, and, and then they take between 30 to 50% cut. And actually, the, 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 the money that is, is left is, is going to the, uh, to the managers and to the, uh, to the labels, not actually to the artists themselves. So we have to have a peer-to-peer -peer monetization model for the music industry. And I think like that, that's the things that we'll see evolving in the next year or two. So, so we expect to see that on the Breeze wallet for music as well coming up soon? So we <laughs> want to do videos first. Actually, I see John here on the back. John Vallis is, is doing a documentary on the Bitcoin Beach, uh, 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 on the Beach Group, uh, the, it, the boys, right? So how the Bitcoin uh, Beach started the Bitcoin revolution in Salvador. We want to put his video on the Breeze uh, uh, interface. We want 
people to be able to monetize uh, their work directly. So you'll see videos, you'll see live videos in Breeze, and yes, I want to do something with music as well. Yeah, I mean, and what we didn't mention up until now is the fact that it enables globally uh, content creators to earn sats, which is uh, huge, like for people in emerging countries, when you're um, earning a little bit and you can earn money from uh, outside your country through digital work and uh, content creation, um, I think that's actually the, the, the networking effect we will see here, the big one. So, but if we change the, users, the perspective now and look from a user perspective, so why actually should I throw sats at you instead of uh, spending my dirty fiat for a membership? Well, I think at least in gaming, especially with mobile gaming, um, you know, there is a minimum threshold for paying for content. And you, know, like you really can't pay for any content less than a dollar, especially in mobile gaming. It is probably the lowest amount um, with fiat that you can spend in game. And so lowering that threshold really, I mean, it, it enables a much wider user base. If people can stream like 10 sats or can send 10 sats for an in-game asset or to use an in-game asset, stream those sats. And so I think that's really incredible. I mean, we've seen our community is, is really amazing. And um, there's a group of them who have actually, um, they've actually won one sat one Satoshi in the games and they've created this group and it's like, they're so proud of this group and it's called the One Sat Gang. And it is like a badge of honor to just have won one sat. And I mean, they just absolutely love it and, and it really fuels a lot of, um, you know, kind of their engagement in the game. So it's really, it's really crazy to see like what micro, how micro payments like really impact in game economies and, and even how people are cashing out from that as well. And I think too, Anita, to kind of address your question as well, um, I do think that that requires a little bit of rethinking from people, right? Like I think that Bitcoiners who are like on zero with fiat are more likely to do that because that's what they do every day, right? Like they're using BitRefill to buy gift cards, they're like either in their local economies going to their like local uh, restaurants, spending Bitcoin and things like that. But one thing I think that actually fixes this a little bit is strike, right? Like if you actually have, uh, a, if you still have some dollars in the bank and you're not totally comfortable, then you just, you know, you uh, send some dollars to your strike account. It's a static balance. It never changes. And then you pay with Bitcoin on the back end when you need to. And I think that tools like that where you basically have like a stable balance in a wallet like strike, maybe eventually there's something where there's a... Uh, uh, a web plugin, a browser plugin that does something similar, almost like a uh, tip in me, except with static uh, dollar balances or euro balances. I think a tool like that uh, would actually kind of unlock this potential more because that was one of the problems I was always puzzling through when I was thinking about how you could get people to rethink about paying for content, right? Especially with an appreciating currency like Bitcoin, they don't want to spend it so much. But maybe something like Strike uh, kind of makes people a little uh, less uneasy about doing that, right? Uh, from our experience, people like spending stats. Like, I don't, I don't see an issue at all. I think a key element to, to, to spending your stats, it's kind of gamification. People like to, to it's, first it's fun. Like in Breeze, whenever you boost, you have this con confetti animation, and like people are posting the confetti on Twitter and social networks because they like this feedback that they did something good. And the confetti is fun. But another, another thing that happens is the feedback look like, the, because they're, they're, they're sending stats directly to the content creator and to the podcaster, what happens is that they have control over the content. And actually podcasters, there are podcasters during the show, they read like the boost messages from, from the listeners. So, so you, you actually, you actually send sets because you want your messages to be read on the podcast. And there, and there, some podcasts are doing like a leader, leading a, a leader table where they have the top, uh, the top listeners that send them the most money and so on. So I think this gamification aspect of uh, of this economy creates a lot of interest to participate in this economy.
I think I think you have population bias when you say all of our users love spending sets. Well, it's a yeah, it's, you're right. It's, it's a lightning <laughs> wallet. <laughs> but uh, I, I would just to piggyback off of what Desiree said, and you know the minimum thresholds. I think that's kind of important for at least the the gaming aspect because you know when you load up a a, a gaming you know wallet or whatever, uh, typically with a, ge a general a general game, there's some kind of like you know deposit twenty bucks or deposit forty dollars, and then you get gems or diamonds or something, right? And uh, with sats, you don't really, depending on how the game developer makes their game, you don't really have those minimum thresholds and you can put in 20 sats or 10 sats or something into, into the game. You don't really have that friction of minimums, which I think uh, help in terms of your question of, you know, I don't have to send my dirty fiat or whatever. I can send very small amounts of sats, you know. Yeah, I see it by myself. It's much easier for me to spend lightning sats than instead of spending on-chain. Because I have like a small amount of uh, sats in my lightning wallet and I spend it for beer or whatever. And so that's also the, 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 the I think the thing about lightning that it enables Bitcoin to become more a medium of exchange which is great. And there's one thing also I want to add about the uh, podcasting 2.0 thing, like with the Sphinx chat, you have a, your own tribe then. And so on the one hand, uh, you prevent spam because uh, you can set up an, an, an entry fee. So you only have people who really want to contribute to this community and be part of it, which I think is also a great thing. In, in, in Priest, uh, will there be something like that? Yeah, we want to integrate messaging and create communities as well, yeah. I think uh, to what Michael said, uh, uh, no one wants to buy a New York Times subscription, right? They just want to read an article. Lightning enables you to read an article without paying, over, overpaying something that you're not uh, 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 typically use or typically need. This one-off economy can be supported by Lightning. Yes, of course. And it's frictionless. Yeah, I mean, I know people are working on browser plugins where you can load your wallet for the plugin and then you just browse the web and can watch videos or read uh, articles and you pay by the minute a set of sites like with podcasting, but just for using other content as well. I, mean, I think one thing kind of outside of this is just, you know, it really empowers users or, you know, everyday people to like curate their own content. Like I think about, I have like a Netflix subscription. Like I, my, I use my sister's Hulu subscription. Like I use somebody else's like Disney Plus. And it's insane that we have these like high thresholds for like just consuming content when I only want to watch like The Mandalorian. You know what I mean? So it's like if I could empower myself to like curate my own content, like I would, you know, it would be much more cost effective and I'd be much more likely to, you know, watch things because I don't have to buy like a $10 monthly subscription fee. So I think it also opens a lot more content. And even on the other side, you know, the, these like massive companies like Netflix and stuff, it's like, oh my gosh, like we might actually get some more users this way as well. Uh, the good news is Breeze is about to uh, launch their new product where you can watch the Mandalorian's new season and it goes directly to the content creators through the Breeze app. Wonderful. I'm sold. <laughs> Two weeks. <laughs> See ya. So talking about the Breeze uh, tech app and your product, um, how's the user adoption? How many growth do you see? So how many? How much, what do we, how much growth do you see with in your product? I always get in trouble when I talk about Zebedee, so I'll just get in trouble anyways. Um, sorry, Andre, if you're watching, but uh, it, we we've been seeing really good growth. Uh, we we uh, recently have worked with a company in India who has many, like I think like 100,000 users uh, to uh, pretty much every day collect a little bit of Bitcoin through, their, through like mobile games and stuff. Uh, we are seeing a lot of people in Latin America uh, collect Bitcoin through our monthly uh, Mint Gox games and, and uh, our, some of our weekly events. You know, the, the, the cool part is, you know, we talked about, you know, paying content people directly and stuff. Well, I feel like essentially what Zebedee is doing to some extent more or less is 
paying, uh, doing charity direct to people who really need it in, in, some, uh, you know, in some countries where you know, some children of families are making as much as the entire family can make like in a day that the whole family makes like in a month and they're actually helping support their family. In some cases, I think that's like kind of like a crazy thing where we didn't know we were going to get into that you know, realm uh, originally. So uh, we've see, we see a lot of people uh, recently in India, um, obviously in, in the America, uh, United States area, and then Latin America, we've seen good growth. And uh, a lot of people like in the US, for instance, it's like, why would I want to play this game for, you know, a thousand sats? I'm going to spend all this time earning a thousand sats. But then someone else in a different country is like, a thousand sats? That's as, that's as much as I make like in a week, you know, or something, you know, whatever the equivalent is. I'm not good at on the fly math, but you know, sometimes these, these, you know, people can win tens of thousands of sets and stuff, but I, I think that's kind of interesting. So yeah, we've been seeing good growth. Great. So I think the cool thing about uh, podcasting 2.0 is the fact that you get the circular, I call it the circular marketing effect, where actually the podcasters become, become your marketing tool because the podcasters are advertising the podcasting 2.0 tools and actually favor the podcasting 2.0 tools in, in, in compared to the traditional way of listening to their podcast. So people are promoting Breeze, promoting new apps like Fountain in, in Twitter, Facebook, social networks as a mean to listen to their podcast and that creates real growth. We grew 10x since we've launched Podcasting 2.0 and it's because Podcasting 2.0, we get new users that are not used to Bitcoin, not familiar with Bitcoin, they're being onboarded to Bitcoin because they like their podcasters and they want this in direct interaction with their podcaster. So that's very cool. That's great. Do you at yeah, um, at Thunder Games, I mean, we are definitely seeing a lot of growth. Um, up until recently, um, if folks aren't aware, it was mostly um, my co-founder, Jack, and um, a contractor who were working on our games. So it was um, not a, a huge undertaking. But um, now we there's two games we have in both the um, App Store and Google Play stores. And those have really just taken off with minimal effort, I think. Um, you know, before we kind of hit the ground running right now, um, we were seeing like 50,000 monthly active users, which is, you know, pretty incredible for like a 1.5 person team. Um, so, you know, we have some really fun games in the works and some cool things that um, we'll be pushing out. But um, it's, it's really just been incredible to see um, the community in mobile gaming come to this whole play to earn. And I think, you know, mobile is is just an incredible way to onboard Bitcoiners. So 60% um, of the entire gaming market is totally mobile. So it makes up more of the market than um, desktop and console combined. I mean, people don't want to be sitting down at an Xbox anymore. They, they want to be out. They want to be physically mobile. So they have their devices and their tablets. That's, that's kind of um, what we're seeing. And so I'm really excited to capture those folks and, you know, make them Bitcoiners. It's so frictionless. You go to the Google Play Store, you go to the App Store, which is incredibly familiar, and it feels safe to users. They can download an app, never have to spend any of their dirty fiat, which they should, but they, they don't have to. And they play and they simply earn sets and they're a Bitcoiner, which I think is just like a beautiful way um, to, you know, bring on this next breed of Bitcoiners. And so we're excited to see some growth around that. But, um, you know, we're just getting started. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another thing that we haven't mentioned yet, I think, is the censorship resistance of Bitcoin and how it enables like people, uh, human rights activists or journalists in uh, authoritarian countries, and we know there are a lot around the world, uh, to earn money and to publish their own content. Colin, can you speak to that maybe as a journalist? Yeah, I think you kind of like summed it up there though, right? Like uh, pretty well. No, it's fine. Sorry. Um, no, it's totally fine. I mean, yeah, I think that uh, Bitcoin offers uh, journalists, especially in, uh, you know, uh, more authoritarian countries or countries with, uh, uh, you know, n less freedom of press to actually monetize their work because not only can they, you know, maybe they're cut off from their traditional banking rails or maybe, you know, people in their country uh, are not giving them jobs like all oh, this, the media state owned, so they don't want adversarial journalism. But uh, Bitcoin is a global community, right? So they might be pu publishing their stuff on, you know, let's say Stacker News or something like uh, Substack or Medium 
or uh, you know some other uh, website, and they're getting payments uh, from people all over the world who want to have insight into what's going on on the ground. Um, the other beautiful thing about Bitcoin too is just uh, you know the ability to make those payments internationally without ever having much slippage and or much you know uh, much of the money uh, you know eroded in fees. You know, like uh, my former colleague at Bitcoin Magazine, Aaron Van Weirdum, you know, he's been working at Bitcoin Magazine since like 2015, 2016, takes his entire salary in Bitcoin. It's just so much easier than the, the company having to go into uh, euros, right? Because he's from the Netherlands, so. Yeah, thanks. Fix the money, fix the world. Uh, censorship, censorship resistant money creates censorship resistant content. And, and I think that's the key. We saw that, by the way, with OnlyFans, where with, the, with the credit card refused to, to wanted to stop uh, their transaction processing, and they decided to, to halt porn for a few uh, for a few weeks. How, how long was it, was it been? I, I can't remember. But if you fix the money, if you, if these platforms are not dependent on credit card processing, then there's no problem with the content itself. So. Well, Oh, sorry, Michael. Can I just jump in just really quick? Um, I don't want to like be a Debbie Downer or rain on everyone's parade. Um, the money, fixing the money, definitely helps. But we also have to make sure that we have like a backbone for the web that isn't easily co-opted, right? Like, if Cloudflare removes your website, you know, if your domain name server gets revoked, then that's also still a problem. And uh, Bitcoin doesn't totally fix that. Um, some other, you know, more decentralized, uh, self-hosted technologies might. But I think that's also a piece of the puzzle here. Exactly. Do you want to add something? The reason, just to interrupt, the reason that we have problems with uh, internet domains and stuff like that, it's also tied to the money. Because you buy the domain from a specific company and the specific company don't want, that, that doesn't want to be tied up to a specific content. So everything is related. At the end of the day, I think everything related to money. Yes. Okay, thanks. Be because actually I wanted to talk about that. Um, so will we see lightning payment enabled centralized platforms or more decentralized platforms on top of lightning in the future? De Decentral... Sorry. Repeat the question. Decentralized <laughs> platform, decentralized future, decentralize the world, decentralize... Everything. Decentralize all the things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is that what the gist was of the topic? I, I, I missed the question. No, the question is like now we have these huge centralized um, platforms where content creators can make some money through subscription models and things like that. Will we see these platforms adopting Lightning so then you just use Lightning for it or will we see those companies also get decentralized? So yeah, so I think the choke point is the money. So to, to answer your question, so if we decentralize uh, the, the, the money, then I think this platform will adopt decentralized money. And we, don't, we, won't be, we, we won't need to decentralize this company because everything will be inherently decentralized. Uh, so personally, I don't think it will lead to prolific, proliferation of more like uh, content services. I think there will be uh, disruptors in the market that will create new technologies using Lightning, and then the big tech will adopt Lightning. I think that's the way it's going to evolve. OK, anything you want to add to that? No, no. I mean, I think, right, you and I were talking about that yesterday, where it was, I mean, there is a lot. Like, we are rebuilding some of you know, what we're familiar with, and I think that is powerful, and hopefully there is some traction. Um, but I think it's going to kind of be the impetus, like this is coming from the bottom, that users, content creators, they want to use this new currency. They want, they want the features that it enables. And so inevitably, I mean, these companies will start to listen to their users. I mean, we see so much adoption of Bitcoin today, I mean, in the last, in the last year. So um, I think it's inevitable that um, these companies will be forced, whether they like it or not, to enable and integrate Lightning. So, so I know this isn't like content creator company, but uh, NCR, one like the oldest companies that invented the cash register, uh, sponsored TabConf, right? And and uh, they're trying to really push themselves into the Bitcoin space. One of the oldest ATM Bitcoin companies or uh, ATM cash register companies are getting into the Bitcoin space. I know you mentioned big tech, right? And I wouldn't necessarily consider NCR big tech, but they are a they are. Fortune 500 and they are a huge company. And I. 
I kind of agree. It is a matter of time before you kind of either force their hand into Bitcoin or they <laughs> they end up getting bought out by the startups that are forming now, right? So <laughs> yeah, and yeah, kind of to piggyback off of some of the stuff that Des said, um, if you look at kind of the way, just speaking from like a perspective for journalism and for other media, if you look at like what Substack and Medium has done, you know, at this point, uh, a lot of people are more willing to trust a single source, like a, a journalist, right? Um, instead of the uh, entire company like New York Times or something like that. Um, and as uh, those kind of platforms continue to disintermediate the uh, big media's power over things, I think that you have, uh, especially with, you know, if we start monetizing through Lightning, because like right now the monetization rails are still stuck on USD and things like that, and they're still kind of caught up in the legacy system. If they, um, you know, kind of start uh, migrating outside of that, and you have an even greater threat to these uh, big media companies' power and also their advertising revenue, I think eventually they will, if, if the right tools come around, or, you know, like New York Times can get onboarded onto this uh, plugin or something like that where, you know, now uh, they'll get, uh, you know, lightning payments streamed to them for just single articles or things like that, I think eventually they're going to just have to buckle under the pressure, right, because uh, their livelihood will be at stake. The ad dollars won't be coming in as much because they won't be as relevant, and they're going to be losing out on a lot of money that's going elsewhere to, like, independent journalists. I remember uh, talking to one of the C-suite members of NCR, uh, like, 10 years ago or something, and I remember him saying specifically, it, it's better to cannibalize yourself, so maybe create a product that hurts your other lines of business than be cannibal or be hurt from outsiders. So I think C-suite people are going to have to make these tough decisions, you know, coming up pretty soon. So thank you. Uh, last statement uh, from all of you, please. So how do you think does the future um, of content creators with Bitcoin look like? The future is very, I think, I think SATs, I think I just want to make a, make a prediction here. I think SATs is going to be the standard. I think we're going to stop uh, saying this Bitcoin, this, you know, in zero, zero point one. I think SATs is going to be pretty mainstream. And uh, I, I don't see it any other way, first off. Um, I think, you know, people like Breeze, you know, Roy, and uh, I think Zebedee, I think we're going to be pushing more and more with uh, SATs-like things. And I... I think he like alluded to like only fans like five times, and I think we're gonna see only Sats pretty here pretty here soon, you know, with uh, going mainstream. So I, I think it's bright, um, and I also want we didn't really mention this earlier. I just want to give a shout out quick to uh, Lightning Page, who also does like a, additional service where like I stream TabConf through Lightning Page, and we actually got tipped through the live stream of the conference. So uh, I hope all conferences, all Bitcoin conferences, use that service in the future. So just. Yeah, definitely. I, I can. I agree with Michael. I think Sats going to be the standard. I think we'll find more and more ways for people to earn Sats through the creator economy, through games, uh, through video streaming platforms. Uh, we'll see more and more content types being integrated into existing interfaces, and I think eventually we'll see mainstream companies adopting. Lightning as a means of payment to uh, content creators. I think that's the future. Um, <laughs> you can clap. <laughs> I, I, I didn't get a clap. I'm jealous, Roy. A clap for Michael, please. <laughs> uh, just really quickly, because I know we're running out of time. Um, obviously, agree with what uh, dudes are saying over here, and. Um, I think that just going back to this, it really does, I think, require people to rethink how they're going to engage with content. But I don't think that's impossible, right? Like oftentimes people will say that or just like, oh, well, you know, you just have to get people to pay for things and you have to get them to think that it's worth paying for. Well, of course. But, you know, it was only, what, 30, 40 years ago that like newspaper subscriptions were very standard in the United States. Uh, other subscriptions, you know, it wasn't until recently in this digital ad age that people really kind of stopped doing that, right? Or it became a little more difficult to get people to pay for that kind of stuff. So um, I think it's going to be a gradually than, uh, than suddenly thing, you know? I think it's going to be eventually more people start adopting these things. It'll start in the Bitcoin community. It'll bleed outward. And then eventually people won't even think twice about it. And in, in the future, I think ultimately a lot of people won't even really know what's going on in the background, right? Like there will be tools that are so simple, like a plugin, that they don't even have to think about it. Yeah, I also agree, SAT's the standard. I mean, at Thunder Games, I, that's all we 
<laughs> kind of operate in. I mean, our average payout is like 10 to 100 sats. So, um, you know, it's very hard to think of those um, rewards in in Bitcoin terms. Um, and so I, I definitely agree with that. And I, I think what Lightning does and is something I'm so passionate about, it, it, it enables everyone um, kind of a fair shot. It, it really empowers everyone financially to, you know, not only become become banked, but also become your own business to become a content creator and monetize everything you're putting out into the world, which I think is incredibly inspiring and incredibly powerful. We aren't even just an Instagram page that gets 10, 10 likes on, an, a, on a picture is something that you can actually, um, you can actually monetize and, and make a living with. And so I think that's just incredibly powerful and it, it's insane to see what's kind of being built on. I mean, there is an OnlyFans now on Lightning. It's called Star backer, I believe. I just found out, so I mean, it, it's there. I, I haven't checked it out, but um, there, we're really starting to reinvent um, all the old paradigms, and I think that's that's just really amazing. I'm so excited to be a part of it with, with everybody here up on stage. Exciting times. Thank you very much on the panel. Thanks for listening and watching. That's it for today, the last episode of 2021. Have a good new year and hear you next time.